So Wahlberg is Captain Leo Davidson. Very anonymous name that rarely ever gets spoken. I didn't, yeah, didn't even know he had a name. And uh, we, what we learned about him is that he has a group of friends who send him a video message. And there's like a hundred people in this video and they're all just hanging out in bathing suits and they're waving at him. And I think Tim Burton, Tim Burton probably thinks like, this is what normal people do, right? They just get around a small group and they sort of just wobble around in their bathing suits. I'm engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Bearing Beams. I'm Matt Stokes. And I'm Lacey Waroth. And out in space on a pod, flying into an electromagnetic storm, who is with us? It's me, Cinematic Joshua. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to the show, Joshua. To talk about your Thank favorite you movie, for having Tim me. Burton's Planet of the Apes. His favorite movie of all time. <laughs> of all time. No, um, I'm a hater of Tim Burton, though, like a lot of other people. So oh. I like. I generally like most of his movies. Oh, you said you're not a hater. Not right. a hater. Yeah, I'm not a hater. Yeah, I, I, I think he's, he's talented. He's got at least specific, you know, creativity, you know, a, a different vision than a lot of other directors. Even if it's like the gothy kind of um, a little played out, but it's still you know, interesting. That is exactly the last time we talked about him was our Beetlejuice episode in October. And I said I had evolved on Tim Burton like I used to really hate his style. But now I'm just longing for directors who are allowed to work in the big, you know, big budget Hollywood system, but still push through their actual vision and their style. And so I'm just grateful style, yeah. for directors like him. Yeah. And I think most of his movies I kind of like. Um, right. Mm-hmm. And you can look at him through the lens of like someone with a true, I, a signature. And he definitely lost the thread. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm kind of hopeful about the Beetlejuice sequel even though the the trailer makes it look like it's just another reverential legacy sequel, uh, but everything they're saying about it is promising about it using practical effects and puppets and stuff. So yeah, we're we're talking about the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes, the two thousand one remake of Planet of the Apes, and um, but I guess before we get into that, Joshua, for people who don't know, like tell us and who didn't hear you on our last appearance last time, we talked about. The butterfly effect, effect, which I just realized, this is the second episode we've had with you where we're talking about a movie that involves the immediate consequences of time travel. <laughs> that's true. I, I do love time travel. That's probably my favorite genre if I had to pick one. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know it's a subgenre of science fiction, which I also love. But um, yeah, I'm Cinematic Joshua. I am on TikTok as that name. And I'm also on YouTube. I'll be doing a lot more of that soon at Ray the Awesome Show. I like to do um, not just general uh, movie reviews, generic ones that anyone can do, just kind of talking about stuff. No, I like to actually have visuals. I like to have concepts. I like to have play different characters, bring some comedy there. So I like to think of my reviews, if I can, as elevated <laughs> movie reviews. I know it's pretentious to say. Uh, but I also do TV uh, reviews also and music. And I have a lot of um, rock fix coming up for Welcome to Rockville. Um, lots of great bands in that uh, this year. And also um, a lot of... I'll be doing my uh, awesome top five play, uh, watch list uh, for each month coming up soon. I'm just really trying to get back to uh, do what's coming up that should be, people should be excited for. Yeah, you you are very you you have a plan and you 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 see it all the way through. So you do get a backlog. I know you're very you're very you're your biggest critic. So I know you care very much about what you put out there. And if you say <laughs> you're going to do it, God damn do. it, you do it. And you, even if it takes a little bit longer I, I than you hoped it would. But yeah, you're yeah, very. Yeah, it takes a while. You know, as you're as a parent, example, I'm still covering. I'm right now. I'm covering up. Uh, you know the the my awesome. An awful top uh, 20 list of 2023. Yeah. I know it's you know months into 2024, but I want to get it out. And um, I'll also be cataloging and re- quickly reviewing all the movies I saw, like around 200 or so of new releases last year. Jeez. Just like a few seconds on each of them, going through Letterboxd. Uh, it'll be a few series of videos. But then I want to get cop, cop again and really get you know back to 2024, which I've done some, but I want to get fully back into that soon. And yeah, it's just tough, you know, trying to stay on top of things. And that's why I do Letterboxd quick one sentence mm-hmm. you know reviews that i think are a little um uh sarcastic and and uh brutal if needed uh but hopefully uh insightful as well and i put that on tiktok also with some music there and, and that's just you know 
15 seconds or so. That way keeps me up to date with yeah. things because it's hard to keep up to date with stuff. There's so much content. And it's I, overwhelming. Know, and no one can watch it all. So so this this will be coming out the day that the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, the first new Planet of the Apes movie since 2017, oh, is yeah. coming out. So I guess like the summer movie season is upon us. Is there anything you're looking forward to specifically this summer? Oh, absolutely. I have a whole uh, on Letterboxd, uh, you know, at Rated Awesome is my Letterboxd. Um, I have a whole... Um, a summer movie, uh, you know, watch list there. I have a top 50, I think, most anticipated or, you know, movies of the whole year. And actually, Kingdom wow. of the Planet of the Apes is my number number one. I don't want to blow it wow, too much, okay. but I love the the Planet of the Apes movies, the franchise. Uh, I like this one, not love it, but I, I love the um, the Matt Reeves versions, you know, the Rise, Dawn, and War for the Planet of the Apes. I love those. I'm planning on rewatching them soon. And this is a continu- continuation of that one. I'm also really excited for Deadpool and Wolverine. I'm excited for you know uh, Inside Out too. I mean, I have a whole lot you know on there, but I, there's so many great things coming out this year. It's it's another great year for movies. Okay, well, I mean, I guess speaking of that, let's go around the room and talk about like our relationship with the very long Planet of the Apes franchise. Joshua, you said you like it. Like, what's your what's your history with the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the first one I watched was the original one from 1968. Uh, I was probably a teenager, you know, 14, 15. I watched it like on Sci-Fi Channel or something like that. They're having some marathon, and I at least watched that first one, or maybe I watched that first one before. And I watched they had like a marathon of all of them, so I, I think I stood up, stayed up and I watched like almost all of them. They were showing all the original ones. I think there's like five night. of them. Yeah, I think they're all pretty good. They're all fun. They all have something interesting to say. Um, there's, you know, some are better than others, obviously. But then I really, uh, and then and then this one came along, 2001, when I was a teenager in high school, and I I was I big Tim Burton fan for a while there, especially, and uh, I like Mark Wahlberg also, and sci-fi, and I love the makeup in this movie. I love the costumes. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, but um, the production design, all that stuff, and it, it was a fun action movie. I enjoyed it. You know, for what it was and then of course the new ones came out like i just mentioned uh and i absolutely love those i mean the way they do performance capture with that um with the humans being uh being the ape characters and having real gravitas to all the ape characters mm-hmm. and have different sub you know um sub you know different storylines and stuff i think they're all fantastic so i think there's a lot of i think it's a great franchise as a whole it's um it was it was this is definitely the the mark Wahlberg tim burton one is the first planet of the apes movie i ever saw while being aware of the old movie, probably mostly through the Simpsons um, and being aware of the twist ending and everything. And I actually really liked this movie. And this, the reason we're talking about this movie is because it's, it's my load bearing beam, but it's my load bearing beam of, Hey, people hate this movie. And I think it's pretty okay. (laughs) Okay. And and still I, during this discussion, I'm going to advance the argument that this movie is pretty okay. That's Uh, your sassy beam. Agreed. Oh, way overhated. Later as a teenager, I watch, the original uh, Planet of the Apes, the Charlton Heston version. And I would say that might be like a top 20 movie for me. It's such a good movie. The twist ending kind of overshadows everything that makes you forget how incredible the rest of the movie is and how incredible the movie is even before you meet any of the apes. And um, so, so I'd always uh, definitely always been like, well, obviously the original is one of the totemic sci-fi movies ever and the remakes. Okay. And uh, I I saw all of the modern entries. I saw Rise and Dawn in theaters and liked them fine and then kind of never really went back to them until the past few days where I revisited them. And I think they're they're objectively better movies, but I still prefer this this version. And I think there might just be I'm just too much an old man yelling at clouds about how I will never connect to CGI apes oh. the way I will to people in costumes. Uh, even the shitty uh, Planet of the Apes sequels from the 70s, I feel like I still, those feel more real to me than the really impressive CGI hmm. apes of the Matt Reeves movies. Wow. Yeah, I had a hard time believing that it wasn't CGI that I was looking at watching this movie. Yeah. I, I, I was blown away and annoyed at how <laughs> mm-hmm. much they had to sit in a chair and take <laughs> and put on makeup and then deliver those lines. Yeah. <sighs> and you can hear everybody just like, how can I open my mouth as little as possible and talk? Like, General Wait, because they're gonna fuck up the makeup, or because they can't open their mouths. They literally can't open their makeup. Won't let them. Oh, okay. Lacey, uh, 
what what's your history with the Planet of the Apes franchise? Okay, well, I definitely saw the 2001 one in theaters. I, I just remember going because a boyfriend said, let's do that. And then walking out and being like, there's a movie. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, waiting for the end. I don't know. Um, I would have been into Mar- uh, Mark Wahlberg by then. And... I don't. I wouldn't have been aware it was a Tim Burton movie. Um, but I definitely never saw the first one until you and me watched it. Unless was that the second time I'd seen the first one no. with you? Okay, so, um, so I've only ever seen the first one and this one, and I feel very unprepared in that I had didn't see any of the other old ones or any of the more recent new ones. So it's okay. Yay! Uh, I, I think that um, the the the, the two thousand one is so in dialogue. Wait, you haven't the, seen any of the Matt Reeves ones? No, I didn't. I didn't know. No, I didn't know I, there was going to be a test. I sat down with you years ago to try to watch one of them and you said I don't care I don't like <laughs> monkeys turn it off I like them too much okay oh, no. I, I had a hard time with fucking ecclesiastical I, or whatever his name is the monkey in this movie the pl- fucking ape god damn it god damn it planet of the apes sounds so fun and then you sit down to watch dawn of the planet of the apes and it's very bleak and solemn and it's just apes sign languaging to each other oh, oh, yeah. with fuck. subtitles Oh God! But I was saying so. But you recently watched all the new ones, right? And then Lacey, you didn't get Lacey in there to watch those. No, fuck no. <laughs> oh come on, Lacey! No. There are we're doing amazing, very different things in this. They're not necessarily fun or light, but they're good. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I do tons of homework, movie watching, and to yeah. get Lacey into the room with me to watch right. something with me, I have to be very judicious in what I select. Uh, she's this may surprise you she's not that easy going and so <laughs> I know I know if I'm gonna have her watch something I need to be sort of very careful about it <laughs> but years ago I like I remember seeing Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and thinking that's a really good movie Lacey you need to watch this and five minutes in it's just apes sign language doing signs to each other and there's a lot of subtitles and Lacey doesn't want right. to read on screen for very valid reasons but then you said we're not watching this <laughs> I don't remember that, so I can't defend myself. It's so good. But I, I did break my subtitle rules long ago. Uh, I think was it Squid Game or was it Parasite? It was Parasite. Parasite. That did it. But that, but that showed me I can, I can totally do subtitles. So maybe it would be different now. Yeah. But um, I, I think maybe it's the wrong thing to do to start with the first one. The first one just gets it so right that I, d- I don't get the need for the second for the two thousand one. One, honestly, I mean, I'm. Uh, I want you to tell me. I want you to convince me otherwise, but I, I won't be able to. And I, and I have. A, I'm going to talk about the development of this movie, and I think that is a big problem that Burton himself doesn't seem like he had an actual reason. Didn't have a well, and you said also that he had been working for a year on something else that uh, fell through, and then this fell in his lap. But this fell in his lap before it had already been thought through, right? These were still his thoughts on how to do the movie. Yes. Yeah. 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 But, but, uh, and we'll get more into this, but basically I think that these were the early days of studios years in advance parking on release dates. And so Fox said July, 2001, we've got that. That's our weekend. We're releasing Planet of the apes full steam ahead. It doesn't matter if the script is ready. It doesn't matter. And like they, 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 they started production on this movie, November of 2000, the movie's in theaters, July of 2001. So it's so, such a short time frame. Okay, then. So they couldn't have Marky Mark do any second takes. Just whatever sleepy little answer he had, they took it. A little, little eye cock he made. Yeah. He's got five faces. They're all cute, but they're cute. You know, does this movie need... Okay, let's get into it. They're mostly let's stairs, Let's get into it. Okay, let's start with our predictions. We'll we, start with Lacey. We all wore blue today. I wanted to say that. Blue like the poster of Planet of the Apes. No, we just did. We're, we're simpatico. Planet of the Apes, here we are, 20... 20- 24 no planet of the apes here we are 3057 after our lord's been dead um i don't remember the timeline i also don't know how this is going to be different and it is a remake right not a not a not a sequel no because there was already a bunch of sequels oh i'm so not knowledgeable of this shit um i don't know mark Wahlberg. he gives me a good time sometimes he's nice to look at He could be a little serious and not know how to make things light. He's no Charlton Heston, but maybe that's okay. I'm hoping for a lot of sexy, sexy primates. I'll tell you that much. Um, 
I hope they're still sweeties because I really liked that message from the first one that they're like, no, no, we really have thought of a better way to do this. Um, I'm, I think I'll like it fine. I don't know. I do not anticipate loving it. Okay, bye. I nailed it. I nailed that shit. I fucking nailed it. Lacey has rarely been more miserable watching a movie. I really felt it from across from her next to me on the <gasps> oh, sofa. That's true. That's not true. I just, it, we were aggravated because and he did, would not go to sleep and he needed a lot of shit and it, it just, it didn't have the stuff to like perk me up and like carry me through those hard times. I'd sit back down and be like this shit again. So that's not really fair to the movie, but, um, do we have to be fair to the movie though? I'm not sure, Matt. I'm not sure. All right. You have to be fair to every movie. Come on now. That's right. (laughs) Prediction for the 2001 Tim Burton, Mark Wahlberg, Planet of the Apes, a movie that no one likes except me. Uh, and I saw it five years ago and still liked it. Now, am I anticipating liking it again this time around? I am nervous, let me tell you. Not because I am worried I'll, you know, my childhood will be crushed, but because I've made Lacey and our friend Joshua watch this movie again. But let me tell you, I've been watching the new Planet of the Apes series, the uh, Matt Reeves and Rupert Wyatt films. Anyway... And they're fine, and they're objectively better movies than the Burton movies, sure, I'm sure. But I still have so much affection for the practical makeup and costumes, and just the time travel space weirdness of that movie, that I'm still looking forward to seeing it again. So cautiously optimistic. Okay, okay. I, you know, I was thinking this was a stretch of a load-bearing beam, and we're just trying to, like, get that sweet SEO. But the more I hear you talk about it, that you are speaking about the I and 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 Joshua might have come up with a beautiful little little flip of the overrated the overhated mm. movie <laughs> which I love this I love this concept and I'm stealing it from you fuck you trademarked eat shit Joshua um I'm kidding I'm not going to use it but I think you're onto something there I think you're protective of like it that it it's in a little time capsule of mm-hmm. protection from CGI and man, did their fucking budget go to that? The costumes. Mm-hmm. The, I'm blown. I cannot. I w- I want to study it under a p- in a petri dish. I can't believe that's makeup. But it has. It also has the other thing I love: the time travel and just sort of the Twilight Zone. Uh, I'm immediately having to deal with the consequences of this world that I inadvertently created. Well, and this motherfucker's playing Russian roulette twice. This is not a smart astronaut scientist military man. He's not the ideal man. For he the just job. ate a pod going after his fucking friend. And then and then as soon as that planet's yucky, he's like, pod. And then it, like, you I'm, idiot. I'm fucking out of here. Where You thought you'd go to the exact same spot. Where did you think you were going? Wait, what are you talking about? That he decided to go <laughs> through an electrical time traveling storm twice is so stupid. No, he knew at no. the end of the movie... He knew at the end of the movie he had to go back to go back through time. But <laughs> he, everyone's dead already. No, no, no. And this is just a throwaway line. He's like, oh, push me forward through time. <laughs> so, <laughs> ergo, I need to go back. I go back through time. And uh, and he does. He's- and no problem. It's just that when he gets back to his own planet, it's got apes on it. <sighs> anyway. All right. Let's do Josh's prediction. Okay. Joshua! Joshua! I remember really enjoying this movie as a teenager, mostly because of its technical (laughs) aspects, the production design, the costumes, the makeup, the actors involved. I think it's a pretty good action movie. I think I'm going to like it a lot less than I used to because of the writing and like the general, it's not a lot of big action sequences. You can really feel the age. But I think it'll still be a pretty good time and especially really like the twist ending. I wish they continued with it. And I think it's way overly hated. Okay, Matt, I like what you tried to do here with that thumbnail. But what is that picture you picked of Joshua? (laughs) Jesus. I'd like to use that for promotional I'd like to use it for promotional reasons, but um, I won't do that to him. Okay, well, Lacey, you can do it yourself. It's just it's something okay. I did in ten seconds. I like it. Um, it seems like you didn't you didn't mind this movie this time. 
It's true. Yeah, it's like I said. It's um, I love the franchise. I love the callbacks to the originals. Um, like I said, the, really the prosthetics is like isn't is just awe inducing. Like, um, mm-hmm. Rick Baker is is a genius. He's a Academy Award winner, makeup artist. He he had a the vision goat. for it. He loves the original apes movies he did some other makeup on on monkey um apes ape uh, movies before and he wanted to get it right and he i think he did he did a fantastic job and they had hundreds of extras they used like other masks and things like that but they also had like a lot of primaries they use like dozens of primaries with actual like just individual everybody has their own individual personality and look and it's, it's great yeah that part's great at least some of them like uh like paul yeah, giamatti are. like some of them you just can see them they look like them they they it it's so and it's, expressive it just sucks because like this is like the very end of the era of that right like but, from now on we're not doing this anymore it had to be such a huge makeup right, crew yeah. though and you you must really truly be torturing your actors i mean for that alone i it does seem a little inhumane a yeah. little, a little Rebecca Romaine. It was during like might. two. <laughs> it Thank was during like two me. hours of the minimum mystique to like joke. four hours at the at the general. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that mystique joke was okay. good, but um, yeah, it's, it was it definitely um, the, the actors. Some actors, you know, like you like it more and they deal with it. But yeah, it's uh, it's okay. worth it, and sometimes in the end. But obviously, we can do it now. Performance capture just as well, even better. And it looks maybe a little better. Right. I mean, it takes a lot less work to do it, at least with the actors. So that's the job. That's what the money's for. You know, it's a trade off for either way. But uh, yeah, this was one of the last ones to do that. And I think it's more one of the more of the fun, like action heavy ones. You know, it's not as serious as some of the other ones. It's not as bleak as some of the other ones of the franchise. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And again, I-, I love the newer trilogy more. I guess the more you guys, the uh, least hasn't seen it, but they're great movies. I recommend everybody watching them. They're not like popcorn, like fun and light. They're like they're heavy topics. They're dystopian. They're great action suspense, and the characterizations are all there for across everybody. Who are the like lead? Like who are the humans? Uh, all a whole bunch of nobodies. Oh, I mean, not. It's James Franco's in the first one. Okay. Jason Clark is oh, in the second one. I remember that but, now. Truly, when I watched these, when I watched them recently, I thought these are the most in, like the most dispensable human leads you could ever have. Like, and that's what's so interesting to me about it's just such a far cry from Charlton Heston to Mark Wahlberg that for so much they tried, they did keep true to the story. Like I knew what the beats were going to be. It really did stick to the the main mm-hmm. the main storyline. So just to be so true to some of it, and then to fucking mark Wahlberg. well there's there there, sh- there is just a giant hole in the middle of this movie where the big movie star performance at the center of it all should go and exactly. Wahlberg is just not up to the he's task just not, he's a lovable big brother who can protect me all day long that is fine but that's all he gets to do like has to- <laughs> he's he's young in his career yeah but he had already done boogie nights like he knows how to act. I, I I think he is somebody who like a good director can get a good yeah. performance out of. I don't think he's I don't think he's bad in this. Oh, one. I think he's so bad. I think this is like a ruinously bad. Really? Like, yes. And I wouldn't. I don't even think I'd blame it on him. It's I, not even I, him. He, he he doesn't even realize his. It's more the more. writing. I, I think. I think it's right. the script. I think I, I think that this is a this is just a yeah. so badly conceived. Yeah. Uh, script where where is where in the direction and the production yeah. design and all that is working really well but they just have nothing to actually work with and he has nothing to hold on to exactly and they're not leaning into any of his strengths i mean they could be in the jungle parts and the in the action parts but they don't but like he's not a believable scientist i can believe matthew mcconaughey is a fucking scientist mm-hmm. but i can't believe he is they don't give him and he doesn't even seem like he is he's just like a monkey companion or a chimp helper i don't like but he's also an astronaut that knows how to work a pod like i yeah. I just don't believe any of it. And then he's totally a leading man, but and two people fall in love with him in this movie, and I don't see it, my guy. I don't fucking get it. Yeah, that didn't work. No, <laughs> the, the um the blank check podcast talks about him like he they said that he only works in movies when he plays low status. Yeah. If you make him a scientist or an astronaut or something, he just doesn't know how like he yeah. always has to have a chip on his shoulder and people are not taking him seriously. Yes. But where he has to play like commanding, in control of the situation, it's just hard. Like he's got nothing there. It's like stop it. I'm going to. I'm going to tickle you. I'm going to tickle you. That's what I want to do to him. One more thing before we get into the history. 
Uh, just for the record, it's not, I, I know we complain about CGI on the podcast a lot. It's not that it's not a valid thing to use in movies and the new apes movies are like the very height of motion capture and CGI. You can watch tons of great videos about how uh, Weta, the production company that makes the, does those digital effects does it. I think I'm just like brain pilled because I went to universal studios as a kid where I'm like, there's no, you couldn't make an attraction around guys sitting on a computer, pointing a mouse and making CGI apes. So it feels to me less like if personal. You, if you can't make a ride out of it, it's not a good movie. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Okay. No, but you like makeup in contrast, you can go see the people doing it and it looks like they're doing a real thing. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a real and a valid thing and that there aren't good movies that use CGI. We blah, make blah, blah. digital art for a living. Yeah. Maybe that's why I think <laughs> it's dumb. That's dumb. We could do it. We can match dots on things. Yeah. Ah, it's cold. Ah, oh, spilled ice water in my crotch. Okay, we can keep going. Keep okay. going. <laughs> you gotta keep oh, that. My vagina. That's hilarious. I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep my vagina. Oh god, it's so wet. Don't get rid of it, love. I won't get rid of this for you. You, you enjoy. This the, pla- the history of the Planet of the Apes oh. begins with Mr. Monsieur Pierre Boulle, who in 1963 publishes Planet of the Apes, or as its title is in French, Monkey Planet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this was his only work of science fiction. His other best known work is Bridge on the River Kwai, oh, yeah. which was adapted into an amazing movie. The screenwriter for both of those movies is the same man, Michael Wilson, who uh, also wrote the 1968 Planet of the Apes. Uh, has anybody here read Planet of the Apes, the novel? Matt is only asking this question so that he can raise his... I have not, but I want to. I've been thinking about it. I, only, I, think I, only, I think I only recently found out it was based on a book. I really forgot about it for a while. But um, yeah, I'll have to... Uh, it's only one book, right? I'll have to look look for it sometime. Yeah. And try to listen it's to it. It's pretty short. I read it all yesterday. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's very... It's fascinating. It's, all, it's like... It's fascinating to read a novel of a movie you've seen a million times... And it's like you're you're entering sort of a parallel world where you're like, I know that character, but that's not what they say. Hey, that's not what he say. You know, but but um the, the the ways that I'm sorry, I'm swatting a fly. <laughs> okay. I'm not trying to get your Let's attention. High five. Um the the book basically opens <laughs> in the distant future, and you have space travelers named Jin and Phyllis. They're on a space cruise and they find a floating bottle in space. And so they get it, and inside the bottle is a manuscript, and it's the story of a man named Ulis. Ooh. And he recounts his story of stumbling upon the planet of the apes. So the rest of the book is just your reading what they're reading in the bottle. And it's his story of going to the planet of the apes. He's been, he's Charlton Heston from the, from the first movie, basically a uh, few differences are the uh, apes don't speak English. Like they can't actually communicate with okay. him. Um, and, and they're also more technologically advanced. And both of those things make more sense to me, but but I I think it would have made the movie less engaging and le- like kind of the movie wanted you to just skip right to like the fact that a religion formed around this that that it's that it's a primate made religion that like we, we if we had to do it over again and we always do have to do it over and over again we will make the same mistakes and use the same things to control and we will get things a little bit better but then make problems where we didn't know there could be it's parenting fucking we're all gonna tell the same lies right <laughs> um the, um yeah, but the English part was uh, as soon as we started watching the 1968 version, I'm like, oh, come on, they speak English. This and, is stupid. And but- it's like he does eventually learn to communicate like they learn each other's languages. It's like right. the movie arrival. But I get that when you're making a movie, you're like, we need to just skip to the part where they can understand each other. Uh, right. Well, and um, I will say about the first one as well, the humans not being able to speak that are already on that planet makes way more sense. Then, and that's that's also the case in the book. Okay, that just makes way. I mean, it, it is a uh, that's a a thing, a mistake. I think the remake does. I think so too. But okay, so the other. I mean, it makes sense, like, like, like uh, story wise. But why would it make sense logically? Why would they lose their knowledge of speech? 
just by being subjugated. Like they can talk to, together if they're in prison or exactly. in camps or whatever, or living in huts. So why no? Why wouldn't they lose their speech though? It doesn't make sense that way. True. Yeah, but like in the remake, they're they're not like the apes have no reason to consider them lesser exactly. beings other than prejudice. And I think that the then it makes the the sort of metaphor. It's like literally just racism, an apartheid state that they're building. And I think that's I think it's more interesting to think. Um, about how like we treat animals. And I mean, that's okay. I think that's that okay. Understand. They're racist. Yeah, but like it's a different thing. I don't. I don't, I don't have a problem with the apes being a uh, race. Right. Yeah. Th- they can be wrong for different. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that's a, a problem having these apes being. But I guess for the first one, what was like so, what was charming to me is that their whole thing was that they were trying to do it different, do it better, um, be better, and so you you have to automatically make a more cruel culture around the kind of ape that could be so heartless towards something that is communicating exactly what they need to you. So it just, it automatically makes the 2001 one lose that charm of these nicer, nicer primates. Yeah. The apes in the original are doing exactly what we do to animals. Exactly. So it is, it is support supposed to be holding up a mirror to you, the audience. Yeah. That makes sense. I also, I realized the 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 Tim Burton version, I think, is the and I've watched a lot of apes movies recently. It's the only one where the apes are unquestionably the bad guys. That's that's the other thing. That was a lot. Like I like that the apes. I I was on their side in the first one. And in in the Matt Reeves one, like you are one hundred percent on the ape side. Okay. They're the sympathetic side. Um. So that's that's interesting. But the okay. So the the reason I'm bringing up what happens in the book is because the 2001 version basically adapts the ending of the book. The ending of the book has the Charlton Heston character escape from the planet of the apes. The planet of the apes is not earth. And then he makes it back to the earth. He lands in Paris, his hometown of Paris, the Eiffel tower. But when he gets out of his spaceship, it's gorillas and as cops and stuff. It's, (laughs) it's basically the ending of this movie. Okay. And then it gets back to the framing story, the astronauts who are reading the message in the bottle. And then it reveals that these astronauts are also apes and they're like talking humans. I don't believe it. That's interesting. So I do think it was, it's kind of a cool nod to the book for this movie to be more faithful to that, uh, to that twist ending. Mm-hmm. And also like, how do you recreate the most famous twist ending in movie history? Right. You just have to go somewhere completely different. Or um, exactly the same. Yeah. The movie, the, the, the movie, a great movie. We've already talked about it. Directed by Franklin Schaffner starring Charlton Heston. It was a huge hit and spawned a franchise in many ways. It's like a forerunner of today's franchise driven films, except that uh, each of these movies had a lower budget and was like treated less seriously, even though they made money. And they're they're really good. If you haven't seen them, they're all worth checking out. Uh, but back then, it was just like a sequel. Psh, that's cheap. That's a B movie. I will, though, give you my gripe of all 60s movies that they just can't seem to fathom a non-hot woman being in the fucking story. And there are two hot women who seem to have nothing to do uh, with anything brave or interesting or they're just there to mate with he literally says that even of the astronaut woman who's in in space with him who does not make it uh that she was going to help populate the new world like fuck she's a scientist astronaut she was going to be our eve ew anyway but even the freaking wild thing girl is hot as shit like nova fuck off nova and then there was a TV show, short-lived TV show in the 70s. But basically, let's fast forward. It's the late 80s, okay? Okay. I'm going to credit the book Tales from Development Hell by David Hughes. You should check this book out if you like stories about movies that spend a lot of time with studios wondering what to do with and hiring different directors and, and writers and the many different iterations. And it has a whole chapter on the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. And the way it starts is... Um, Adam Rifkin, who later directed movies like Detroit Rock City, had a sort of small indie movie called Never on Tuesday that was uh, got a lot of notice in 1989. And the president of Fox was a big fan of it. So he invited him, him in to the studio for a meeting and said, what would you like to do if you if you if, if you were working with us? What would you like to do? And he said, I love Planet of the Apes. I think that you, you own Planet of the Apes. You should make a direct sequel to the original film. 
And that kind of gets the ball rolling um, over the next decade of developing what for the most part is supposed to be a sequel, kind of like what, what movie what happens in franchises now where you just make a direct sequel to the original. Um, and originally Rifkin is involved, but then it goes over to bigger directors like Oliver Stone. And that eventually, would have been interesting. Yeah. Eventually settles on director Philip Noyce, who made the um, Noyce. who made the uh, Harrison Ford, Jack Ryan movies, and the star attached was Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and the script, everybody was saying this is the best script I've ever read. It was called Return of Return of the Apes. Again, it is a direct sequel to the original movie that's going to ignore Planet of the Apes two through five. Okay. And again, you have Arnold Schwarzenegger, the biggest star in Hollywood at the time. Uh, but there's this great detail in the book. Um, where there's an executive at Fox and he has this idea he keeps bringing up. I'll read from the book. He said, quote, what if our main guy finds himself in ape land and the apes are trying to play a game like baseball, but they're missing one element like the pitcher or something. And when I guy comes along, he knows what they're missing and he shows them and they all start playing End quote. Okay. So he tells this to Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Philip Noyce and they're like, um, okay. And, he's, and and so they leave the meeting and the script gets rewritten and delivered to the studio again. And the same guy's like, hey, where's the baseball? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're like, what do you mean? He's like, doesn't have any baseball. So at this point, they lose Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Philip Noyce. And it's just, we've all had bosses like this. They're like, but if I don't have my own idea, oh, what's the God. point of me if I can't put my own stink on it? I want Abe's playing baseball. So that's how they lose on Arnold But what primate of any kind would be playing a game without some sort of major part of it that makes it work at all? Who, why your, would they be playing it? He's just the ideas guy. You figure that out, little writer man. You go figure this out. I just have these great big ideas. We really have had this boss many times. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the project ends up getting offered to screenwriter. William Broyles, who had written Apollo 13 and Castaway. And he said he had no interest in it, but the studio was like, please, uh, listen, how about this? You can do whatever you want with it. And he said he was looking up in the night sky and he thought, I guess I could like really make it my own. There's some stuff I could do. And he writes a draft that Tim Burton reads and apparently loves. And uh, Tim Burton at this point is spending a whole year in this famous story of him developing uh, Superman Lives, which was written by Kevin Smith, and Nicolas Cage is attached to play Superman. Oh, wow. This movie enters pre-production, and it's a famous movie that totally falls apart. And it so, sounds amazing, actually. And, Fucking Kevin Smith, Tim Burton, and Nicolas Cage? Yeah. Sign me up. And uh, so Tim Burton has nothing to do, so they offer him Planet of the Apes, and he's like, yeah, okay, shrug. I'll do it. Here's what he said. He said, I quote, I wasn't interested in doing a remake or a sequel of the original Planet of the Apes, but I was intrigued by the idea of revisiting the world. Like a lot of people, I was affected by the original. It's like a myth or a fairy tale that stays with you. The idea of reimagining that mythology was very exciting to me. End quote. And the, the thing they kept saying is this isn't a remake. It's a reimagining. Is it? Mm -hmm. No, it's not, my man. No. Oh, barely, what are we, barely. It is. Well, the, fucking barely. All those differences you're talking about, that's me. the reimagining part of it. Well, Joshua, Fine. like Tim Burton is very distinctive uh, style and vision. And he has his things that recur throughout his movie. Like Melissa Glassbottom. Like striped. Uh, What's her name? What? Like Helena Bottom Carter. That's what I said. Okay. But like this feels like the least <laughs> personal of all of his <laughs> movies. Like, like, <laughs> I knew Joshua. Yeah. Could kick out. Um, do you do you see much Tim Burton in this movie? More the designs of of the of the you know the the technical aspects of it, like the costumes, the hats, the swirls, there's shapes, there's things like that. Um, he's got some of his actors in there also. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I was I was I would say it's a Tim Burton movie. I don't think it's a void of his touch. You know what? I didn't even think about that, Joshua. But you're right. The those hats are so extra. Um, the, they're, they, they very much Wizard of Oz vibes. Um, right. It maybe also it's like whimsy and the way that he decided to let them move just like 
apes like the way that the huge jumps and the climbing the randomly climbing up shit and just swinging from something for no reason it just it is kind of his playful kid like Mm -hmm. framing of stuff it's 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 what a kid would do if they were a monkey adult and i think that i think that all the like ape society stuff like the dinner party yeah, and just like looks at like there's you see, have like the have the heavy metal apes, and you have the <laughs> ape and his wife who are like going to get down to some ape s and some s s and ape. Uh, <laughs> I think I think that that's the stuff that probably that's attracted sweet. him to it. But then you kind of get away from all that, and it just becomes an action movie for that's the, last the worst hour. part of it, though. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh wait, what part? What part's the worst part? I think all those stupid little um, the way that they're like humans. I think it's it's so cheesy. I think that's the part that doesn't work at all for me. Oh, I like that stuff. The, the foreplay, the eight good, foreplay. Like you it. think? I think it's. I think it makes it too silly. It, it makes it more yeah. fun, I guess. But I think it's too silly. No, and I have that same note. I've like I don't need an exact replica of human street punk kids wearing leather jackets and smoking from a bong. That is so stupid. So that's what I mean by like. I guess you're reimagining it, but you're just putting way too many human qualities into this world and leaving out a whole bunch of other random ones. And the maybe we're not here yet for this complaint. No, go ahead. But the variety of of ape i i understand humans have variety but we don't have a variety in the people we choose to serve at the very top of our military those are some of the most buttoned up prestigious straightforward white men you're ever going to see they're not like the most extra fucking evil ape i've ever seen in my life how the hell would he be the head of the military you're talking about general thane he's out of his fucking mind he doesn't make sense lacy i think that you you do you are not giving credit to all the great military (laughs) weirdos of human history (laughs) i mean come on tim roth is general macarthur uh, i mean shut up we'll talk more about we'll talk more about general fade okay let's um, get there just a little just a little bit more uh th- this movie uh as we said had an extremely rushed out. production schedule and um they made it work and this movie actually was a big hit okay. but it is the rare movie that was a big hit that they never considered making a sequel to Burton is quoted as saying they they asked Tim Burton if he would like to direct a sequel. He said, "I'd rather jump out of a window." <laughs> um, and then the movie was called Rise of the Apes until shortly before it was going to be released, when they just renamed it to Planet mm. of the Apes. Right. Oh, uh, we'll briefly talk about Mark Wahlberg. He had Boogie Nights come out in '97. That made people start taking him seriously as an actor. He's coming off of Three Kings and The Perfect Storm. Basically, Perfect movies for him. The project of making him a major movie star is well underway. But this movie's kind of a blip because I don't think most people liked him in it. Mm-mm. And uh, 2011, when Rise of the Planet of the Apes was coming out, um, Wahlberg was asked about it. And he said, quote, I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it was pretty damn good. Well, ours wasn't. <laughs> it is what it is. Ours wasn't. They didn't have the script right. They had a release date before they had shot a sh- a foot of film. They were pushing Tim and pushing him in the wrong direction. You have to let Tim do his thing. Right. Uh, he said, I have no better time on any movie than I had working with Tim. Aww. I had the most amazing time with Tim. Aww. And then, then the most Mark Wahlberg quote ever, when we were doing reshoots, he came out with me to Paris. We're in the club. Well, I'm sorry. I need to do the Wahlberg voice. You do the voice. We're in the club. Tim was in the club, man. Tim was in the club. Then he'd be drawing people and all his characters look the same. He'd be drawing people in the club. Celtics. Um, oh my God. <laughs> okay. And then, yeah, got rebooted again. Much more serious minded. But uh, he, he did that one for like Tim, these, by the this way. Current series of movies. He did what? No, I'm saying like like he actually didn't read the script. He he signed on before there was a script, and he did it for to work with Tim Burton. Oh. Like he, he really wanted to work. Yeah, with I him, saw that so too. That's cool. He would yeah, do, like, he said. He like, said. Yeah, he did say like uh, it was just. Just wanted to work with you. I don't, it doesn't even matter what it is. I just want to work with you. He's, you know, at the top of his, Tim Burton in the 90s was like at the top of his power. Um, okay. Well, now one hour in, we can start talking about the movie. <laughs> Shit.
Okay. Um, it's a 20th Century Fox movie. Okay. Isn't it weird that the new movie is a Disney movie? That's weird. Is it? They're going to make a ride out of it probably, Matt. It's the thing you want. It's just weird. Um, <laughs> no one gets hung up on the shit like you. I uh, I actually really like this opening theme by Danny Elfman. I like Danny Elfman. It's got the uh, the percussion mixed with that sort of oh. falling bass. Yeah. Um, okay. Another highlight okay. of the movie is the score. Yeah, I like the score. I like the score right away. Okay, so we go we go to the Oberon, the space station, where we meet Pericles, the great chimp. And they instantly fucking lose me. And I wrote in my notes, I watched this movie twice in the past two days. The first time I watched it without Lacey. And I wrote in my notes, Lacey's not going to like this. Because Mark Wahlberg immediately teases Pericles the chimp by offering him a treat, a treat but then not giving it to him. Um, Give him the treat. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, uh, no, I'm upset that he's in a full outfit. That monkey doesn't want to be in that full outfit. I he looks he... so sweet. <laughs> it's not a monkey, he's a chimp. That but chimp I bet deserves takes, to breathe. Takes a lot of pride in his work. He is so sweet. I just, I just, the the mishandling of something so cute is never going to be okay with me. I realize these humans are nice to him, but that other human was not. At least give us an ugly chimp. There are no such thing. Okay. I read recently about this, uh, this, this thing, I think in the New Yorker about th- this AI project of trying to interpret whale communication. And it's like, this AI may one day enable us to make contact with whales. Do we want that? And then the question was, what do we say to them? <laughs> and I think this movie and and uh, like Lacey just said, the answer is we probably shouldn't. They're just going to tell us to stop putting stuff in their water. Yeah, leave us alone. It's not going to be a good report on the humans. Yeah, let's plausible deniability. No need to communicate with the orca. Okay, so Wahlberg is Captain Leo Davidson. Very anonymous name that rarely ever gets spoken. I don't, yeah, didn't even know he had a name. And uh, we, what we learned about him is that he has a group of friends who send him a video message. And there's like a hundred people in this video and they're all just hanging out in bathing suits and they're waving at him. And I think Tim Burton, Tim Burton probably thinks like, this is what normal people do, right? <laughs> they just get around a small group. <laughs> And they sort of just wobble around in their bathing suits. I'm engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's a there's there's a space storm. Oh, a, no. An electromagnetic storm right outside the Oberon. And uh, they want to put Pericles in the pod to go out and investigate. And Wahlberg's like, I want to fly. I'm a space. I'm an astronaut. I want to go fly out there. But they make his chimp do it instead. And then he Im- oh, Pericles the chimp immediately gets lost in the storm. So Wahlberg commandeers a space pod goes out to look for him himself. And then also immediately gets sucked into I mean, the storm. It's very, it happens it so is fast. Quick. <laughs> right. We are not paying these actors. <laughs> We're getting in this spaceship and right the fuck out of the spaceship. Yeah. And, uh, he crashes onto, um, he crashes onto the planet. This, 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 and this little air pod. Look at that. It yeah. looks like an air pod. I mean, an earbud. Well, we see him go through what we see him go through like a wormhole thing. This this something's up with this space storm, basically, is what we're saying. It's real magnetic. Guys. And he's getting mysterious. See, even that spaceship is is like the helmets kind of. And yes. it's like the Tim Burton oh you know, visual you're right. style. You're right. It's the it's the it's General Thade's helmet. If you're looking for the Burton, it will come. <laughs> you just gotta know what to look, look, look for. It. I mean Danny Elfman also, you know, frequent right. collaborator, frequent, you know, composer. It's got Colleen you know Helen Bottom. I think this is the first movie he worked with Helen Bottom. On Carter, who eventually married or dated or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, he's, but then she was in like every movie after that with him. Right. And yeah, uh, they, Tim Roth also worked with him a few times. So he's yeah. good people. Yeah. yeah. He and he and Helen of Bonham Carter did the Spider Man meme with each other. You're a freak like me. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Oh, shut up, man. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He, he crashes down onto the planet into a bog. And 16 minutes into the movie, we meet our first apes. In the in the Charlton Heston movie, it takes like forty five minutes before yeah. you meet the apes, and like Wahlberg is so nonplussed by any of this, <laughs> he's like a mildly annoyed. He's like, wait a minute, he's in shock. I, he's Bye. not even communicating shock. <laughs> like, hey, something's up with this planet. Um, These humans don't have Gillette. It, it, you have to be, you know, if that happened in real life, 
you have to just, you know, soak it in and take it so you don't get killed right away. You know, like you have to, you can't stand out immediately. You have to try to just like, you know, if there are a bunch of like, you know, fascists in your room and trying to like, you know, take over your, your, your house or your world or whatever, you just have to kind of take it for a minute to try to obsess the situation and, and not, not jump out and fight right away. You know, you have to try to, I think he's fine. I, I think he, I think he did the appropriate amount of, of shock and also just, yeah, just to keep it, keep it in and, and just, you know, being there and then, then, then try to break out when he, as soon as he can. Well, what? I mean, and he's put straight down into a stampede of humans running, and he's like, "Well, I'm a human. Mm-hmm. I should run." And he does that. I mean, he's in fight or flight the whole time. Yeah, he's it's he's not he's not really dialing it up here, but it it didn't bother me. It's I know I keep comparing it to the original, but the original has Charlton Heston, who is the most interesting character in the movie, even when he's surrounded by apes. But it has him just like wandering the planet, this empty planet for like 30 minutes. Uh, and the, and just but but just there's no awe in this movie. There's right. no like sense of wonder of what the hell is going on or mystification. That's true. And I know that the original exists and they know that you know that. Exactly. But they can still try to work to make you feel it a little more. That's all I'm saying. I think it's on his face. I think. <laughs> so yeah, we we meet Helen A. Bonham Carter, and uh, she's a human lover. Lacey, can you tell us about Ari, Helena Bonham Carter? Well, she's too into these humans. Um, she's weird immediately. I I I end up liking her, but she because I know that she is the like uh, she's the most privileged in this town. She 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 signals that to me like she doesn't have to follow the rules. She can just walk in and out of people's establishments and hang from their bullshit and tell them they're doing stupid things. And she gets to she gets to be political uh, and gets to care about rights beyond her own because she is wealthy. So we've got some rich bitch going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like that she cares i mean we need her fine but anyway she she's there's a slave trader uh limbo limbo and he's fucking great paul Paul giamatti Giamatti is amazing in this role and i didn't immediately know he was a slave trader but that that makes sense there's some reimagining there perfect good good call burton um and he's just kind of like sorting them out and taking the the children from their parents and then branding them or whatever and um seeing who who fits the bill for whatever need he knows he needs to fill and the uh, ari what did you say her name is ari. ari gets close enough to the cage and and um our hero sees a rod and goes i'll ha i'm threatening your monk your 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 lady here woohoo um but but she immediately connects to him and and he is saying help me help me I'll make it worth your while in her ear. And, and she, because she knows that the slave trader just wants their money. She says, I will, I will buy him. Give me him. And crucially you're hot. So yes. Does she, that's bothering me. Does she think humans are hot? Should she, thinks, she think she that thinks this human is hot? That's fucking bizarre. This is a, this is a horny. AI Apparently. It is so horny. Um, <laughs> But then the yeah. lady, the sexy fucking like, God forbid there's not a sexy wild thing there um he he, anyway she he also demands he they take her too i don't remember why Eh. because he's horny everybody's horny yeah yeah they um i i think another reason i might like this movie is uh this whole town feels kind of disney world like it feels like a very practical set but kind of small scale like you could go walk through it at, at disney world i felt that way about the first one too just felt a little more rustic yeah, she buys she buys Mark Wahlberg or sorry, she buys Leo Davidson and the the woman whose name apparently is Dinah or okay. Dana. I'm sure it's Dinah. Estella Warren. Whatever. Who, uh, they were trying to make a thing. She was a synchronized swimmer and a model and they were trying to put her into movies. But um, yeah, she takes them into service in her house and they have a big ape dinner party with all of ape high society, including Otho himself, Glenn Shadix, who plays a big orangutan and his weirdo wife. And um, General Fade comes in. General Fade, the villain of the movie. Does anyone like him? Uh, he darkens the door every time he walks through it. Everyone just seems to be disturbed by him. 
Yeah, but he's, yeah. They, he's seen, you know what he is? He's on Game of Thrones. He's the, the bastard. He's Ramsey Bolton. He's Ramsey Bolton. Like, like he, everybody knows he's mm. not well, capable of huge cruelty. He will make your life hell if you get on the wrong side of him. He's got enough power to influence that, but not all the power. He still needs stuff. But I mean, as soon as he comes in the room, the room fucking changes. Mm-hmm. He, why? Yeah. I mean, I, I, what, I, I, is it working? Was this, was this on purpose? Um, what mean, meaning do we like this performance? I mean, the performance is good, but does it fit in this movie? I don't know. It, it feels no one else is acting this I, way. Yeah, I don't think the performance is good. I, I like Tim Roth, but I think he overplayed this, overacted yeah. the hell out of this role. I don't know why he's so angry in every like breath he has. He's got one like small scene with um, Ari, who apparently they're kind of like love interest, or they, or at least he wants to in the past, or whatever. And he's a little more softer, but generally yeah. he's rough, like on, at a ten scale of anger all the time, and it's just so annoying. Even to like it Paul Giamatti, who's doing his job, and he's like jumping out at him, and like, what are you doing? And you smell like humans, all that stuff. It's like, shut up, man. Just keep it down a little bit. Can you just be? cool and evil I'm over so there and not be evil with every all your other he, he, <laughs> right i'm so glad you agree you. on your yeah, team I, I appreciate that he's yeah. he's making choices but um they're the wrong ones i mean he's just he's just turning it up to 11 and it's not dialed in but the whole movie seems so yeah poorly conceived that there's no like consistency it doesn't fit with anything it else. does thank you i'm and so then, glad that this is true because and, you've got something so silly like the wife of ortho where, like she's so Manhattan so so human Mm -hmm. and then this they they this dinner scene like they drop like a lot of threads that seems like maybe they're gonna follow but they don't like they suggest that once upon a time they tried like a welfare system for humans but it didn't work out and then also the humans are repopulating way faster than the apes and we're encroaching on their habitats so it's like wait a minute is this like a metaphor for but it's like the movie's not interested in going to any of those directions. And then the Senator who's played by David Warner, who's Helena Bonham Carter's father, he invites Thade over and he's like, Thade, you're a little too extreme. And then Thade quotes Barry Goldwater. And he says, <laughs> extremism in defense of apes is no vice Senator. Uh, yeah. There's just, they're throwing so much at you. Um, th- but the movie's not interested in really following any of these threads. Well, plus the random absurd cruelty to their servants. Like this family who you respect has chosen to have humans in their home and they treat them a certain way, but you're just going to put all the food on the floor. Number one. Mm-hmm. And then it just doesn't make sense. Who would tolerate this if they weren't all just really scared of this kid? They're all really scared of this kid. This is fucking kill him then. No, this is what happens. This is what bullies do. Nobody actually likes the bully, but everybody's afraid because they don't want to be the one standing up by themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very powerful and well-observed, actually. Fine. Uh, oh, and Michael Clark Duncan, I, play, I believe, plays Colonel Atta, and he mentions the great Simos, which I guess is an anagram for Moses, but... uh he he prays to Simos, oh. and everybody else in the table like kind of goes along to be polite. But it seems like he's the only one who maybe actually believes in Simos, the great Messiah, who will one day come back. Well, because all these people are elites who already know the actual way that the religious part was passed down and created by other apes, right? So maybe he's at a a, a need to know level of work. A, a, a class ah, level okay. where he still buys in and thinks they all buy in. So he's being he's. He's being respectful, but he also just looks like an idiot because he doesn't he doesn't realize they all know the truth. I got gotcha. you. It's Scientology, but he hasn't reached. Uh, he's he putting hasn't on. Gone clear for, yet. You guys are the most religious, right? So I'm yeah. gonna excuse me. I'll say grace, and everyone's like, Jesus Christ, we made it up. We made it up. Yeah, it's like that. It's hard to know who who really understands the Simos has a faith and who has the the truth. Like who. who it's not really clear. Yeah, it's not. And because later in the movie, Michael Clark Duncan like makes a big deal about everything I believed was a lie. And it's like, but I, I'm sorry, I can't follow you. So you did believe and you believe because he told you to believe, but now you realize he like, no, I can't but track Michael, it all. But Michael Clark Duncan is the person that's on that level. He's not, because even the, the powerful bully kid didn't t- find out anything until his dad was on his deathbed. So it's like it, it he just happened to be in a room where like most of the people probably knew. I don't know. 
I mean, you can figure that out once you go through the yeah. movie, right, right, movie but, like right, this. But, but, but in real time, it's like, what is happening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wahlberg pretty easily escapes his cage. <laughs> Very easy. And then Helena Bonham Carter helps him. And then he's like, if you come with me, I'll show you something that'll change your world forever. And so they run into the woods where his... Uh, That's not what they do. They get all the other people, too. Okay. They get all the right, other fine. people, too. Uh, they get they they go to where his spaceship is crashed crashed in the bog and we find out apes are afraid of water very conveniently shit i meant to look up if apes if real apes are scared of water that is a random little thing plucked from nowhere is that in the book no that's not in the book um but it helps them escape later but yeah well the limitation in the first one is that they don't know about flight there are no, no birds they've never even seen an airplane fly through the air it's magic and they're, they're not even allowed to really talk about it and that's how they keep their people contained. So I guess the maybe it's a myth in their in their religion that monk, that apes cannot swim because that's how they keep them contained, right? Keep them away from the the uh, forbidden areas. They have to cripple their their people in some kind of major way, transportation wise, yeah. mobility wise. It's such a small colony when you think about the the vastness of that planet. It's tiny. Just the 1968 movie had so much. Um, so much about like the, the ape elites concealing this forbidden knowledge, uh, that this movie kind of hints at, but doesn't seem that interested in. And when you watch the original now, that stuff is so powerful uh, Yeah, because like you can, you can see it as a metaphor for anything, any kind of revolutionary idea or just any kind of a idea method that they to don't control. To, yeah. Oh, there's, there's. There's a very easy formula to controlling lots and lots of people and not being lots and lots of people yourself. <laughs> and it's this fear. I have a quick answer about the water situation. I looked it up uh, while you were talking. And um, they said that they said that some uh, some apes fear water like gorillas, and, but some chimps like playing in water, but they can't swim very well because they have more muscle than um, than fat. And so they don't swim, don't have much buoyancy like humans do got it so it's kind of both okay i was wondering i forgot to look this up uh or or just rewatch this part of the movie in the beginning when they have all their on the spaceship they have all the chimps in cages do we see other species of apes do they have orangutans and gorillas oh that's such a good point no i mean we don't see it in, oh oh yeah on, on the spaceship yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few of them. I don't, you don't see it but there's several apes that are there they're experimenting on so like you don't see cmos which i don't know what kind of animal they is um is he a chimp or is he a gorilla or what but um yeah it's uh, you know there, i think there's several of them because how else would they all evolve how would they have That's these Matt's point, on, right? you know, like, society they, they didn't to, have them on the, on the ship i just like if you're doing a scientific experiment isn't it easier to just have one kind of one kind of ape i know you're just saying matt has discovered a plot hole a plot hole well joshua joshua is more um forgiving than you and he just fills it in for them he no, fills, i did too he fills in the hole with the dirt okay i filled in the hole too i All was right. just i was just wondering okay um and i tried to find out are there instances of apes in the wild interacting with other species of right. apes and what happens and uh, apparently it doesn't happen very often. i didn't think so i did find that interesting that they were like kind of giving you a a, p- a potpourri of all the different, you know, and, and that, that someone like a baboon, which is what I think ortho is, right? Like baboons aren't apes. He's an orangutan. Oh, orangutan. Uh, oh, right. He's like from Jungle Book. Um, that he would be in a in a high position because he is so different from all the other ones. And then anyway, anyway, whatever. They give you a bunch to, he like Tim Burton do, he gives you a bunch to look at. Not necessarily a lot of explanation. <laughs> the book and the Charlton Heston movie do make a, do make a point of, uh, chimps are like the scientists okay. gorillas are the are the muscle and mm-hmm. orangutans are like the government okay okay and this movie's like nah they're all just mixing together yeah which is fine it's fine they mix them all up yeah. um yeah mark Wahlberg, he gets his bag and he has some tech stuff and he's like wait a minute this is saying my the oberon's on this on this plane i gotta get out get over to my ship and uh he also has a gun and this <sighs> it's the only thing he gets out of his bag besides that little Tamagotchi. The Tamagotchi guides him to the Oberon. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I like the choice of um, these apes in this movie don't have guns. Yeah, I like that too. Guns is like the equalizer to the people who are more physically uh, imposing than you. They even say that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. 
Yeah. Back back in the ape village, uh, General Thade goes up to uh, Ari's dad and is like, your daughter's been kidnapped. It's time for you to grant me emergency powers to successfully prosecute this war against the humans. And we just talked about the movie X-Men 2, and I realized the exact same thing happens in that movie. Yep. And I was kind of mixing them together in my head. Uh, but in this movie, like, we never see what powers he actually gets, how anything has changed, what he's doing now that's different. He just doesn't have to ask for permission to kill at will. It's what it seems like to me. It just means, well, it's martial law. I make the law, I'm the marshal. Yeah. So I'm going to go kill everybody. Right. Exactly. You don't have to get the orders from the Sentinel. Right? Yeah, but it seemed like he was doing whatever he wanted anyway. The monkey puns are fucking endless for you. Matt has named this slide Charlton Hestape. It sounds like a... Those are not for public consumption. <laughs> it just sounds like a disease. It doesn't sound good at all. Anyway, you got okay. Charlton Hestape. That's so stupid. Um, all right. So now is when we go in to see the dying father of the madman who I cannot commit his name to memory. I'm Fade. sorry. Fade. Um, General he's Fade. Going to see General, General Fade. Fade. He's going to see Papa. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Um, is there a soul in there? You're That's creeping General me out. That's I mean, his would, famous Listen line. to the way that Tim normally talks, or like any other movie, you know, he's done. And this one, I, you couldn't even tell it's him. Like his voice I is tell. Uh, so crystal and so angry in every little, right. every little breath you take. <laughs> you honey, bunny. It's like, you can be mean and just don't have to be like right Buzz. and when uh, he hyper, dials it back you know, for just strong. that moment yeah. it's like that it's like such a nice like breath to take when he's just that moment you talked about earlier with um chari what's her fucking name yeah. ari and, and it's just ari. like mm-hmm. yeah it's just like there you go take it to a, a nine that's that feels real nice <laughs> all right so he goes in to see his dying dad who is played by charlton heston um a little bit of a waste but i can kind of see that it's him i, I mean we need to, we, if he's alive we need to bring him in right um and i mean his dad just so in tune with his That's psychopath nice son At, yeah is i can't tell if it's a slap in the I face wish we got to see more of his character though he didn't right, do a exactly. lot you know, he's, he's got like basically one scene where he's dying i wouldn't like see like why he i don't know just a little more about what he's about Heston, exactly. Heston was not going to give them more than a day of this. But the, he gave them full makeup? Is it not yeah, a no, slap? Yeah, no, if he the- has to do another day of makeup, he's not doing that shit. What I'm saying is I can't believe he didn't play a human. I thought for sure he would have been like scraggly old man uh, guy, <laughs> like just, just some other guy in a cage. See, you know? they, that's more interesting to me. That that That's what they would do today. They'd be like, there's rumors of a man in the desert exactly who knows what's good then you exactly. find him exactly and it's taylor from 1968 i love that ah and you realize it's a sequel not a remake oh uh-huh. yeah they could have done that i like that they made him an ape all right fine but okay so he's just so in touch with his emotionally in inaccessible son um but I think he's probably just feeling a little paranoid because he's about to die and he needs to pass some secrets on. Son, I feel like there's something you're not really telling me about this human you hate so much. Is it because you think he's an astronaut and that I'm lying to you your entire life and there's ancient secrets? Yes, Dad. That's a mighty Maybe. specific thing, but yes. <laughs> that's Maybe. what happened. Maybe that's why. <laughs> you're lying to me, Papa. Well, son, go break that giant decorative ornament and and find the ashes of your ancestors plus a really broken gun and this hold, ornament yeah that ornament and hold it the wrong way you idiot but the the, the the secret is guns 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 are what humans do it's what was their undoing and hey how about this they're making charlton heston say this about guns when charlton heston uh-huh. what did charlton heston love in life <laughs> What did my grandfather, lifetime NRA member, have on his wall? A framed letter from Charlton Heston thanking him for a lifetime of service to the NRA. That is so true. And in the scene, he's like, oh, the guns are the worst thing that ever happened to us. Or he just turns around and says, that's right, guns make us human. I wish I meant to watch the scene again. How did they talk him into doing this? Right. I, I meant to watch the scene again and see... Is the gun ever in frame with Heston? Is it pro? Did they lie to him about what this <gasps> scene is? <laughs> and he doesn't actually know that they're talking about is. a gun? Yeah, I don't think it is either. It might not be. It just, it, right, yeah. just broke into a little 
base and then Fade holds it, but I don't think you see him. He doesn't point it at him or anything. I don't think you really see it. Yeah, it's in not the in the shot. frame. The they told they told Charlton Heston on the bed. Something else is right. in that face. It's eyeglasses. It's eyeglasses that they don't ever let Maybe. them see well, or they'll take over the world. <laughs> There's got to be other artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Nintendo Switch. Don't give this to them. So yeah, so ha- Charlton Heston was just months away from getting harassed by Michael Moore. Uh, at his house. What bowling for Columbine? Yeah. So where did that gun come from? Do you think? Just back from because the this days is not of Earth, CMOS. right? In, actually, in this movie, this is not Earth. I mean, yeah, it would have been on have it guns have been, on, the, w- on the astronaut ship. They, they had to have. have. Yeah. Yeah, because Wahlberg. You're right. It's no, kind of a shit gun. No, Wahlberg has one in his pouch. But it's on a the nice one. But it's a okay, nice right. silver gun. Yeah, but that, this is a bad. This one has ugly aged, gun. This one has aged over thousands well. of years. Wait, and Mark Wahlberg has like some sort of hybrid gun blaster thing from like Star Wars. His gun shoots lasers. That's a weird gun. Fine. This is it's, just a. All right. I, th- I think I think there's no doubt this is supposed to have come from the it comes Oberon. from the ship. It comes from you know it was it was very clever of them to make the wreckage of the Overon ship look like the points of the Statue of Liberty's crown, right? Oh, did because they? the whole Jesus fucking Christ. Because the whole time you just think you're looking at the wreckage you're expecting, and he's just discovering it very a lot sooner and, and not knowing what he's in. But then, okay, you're like, oh, you're in a fucking working ship. Hmm. Never mind. To throw you off, yeah. But you see why Thade hates humans because his father, Charlton Hestape, also hates humans. In fact, right. he says, damn them, damn them all to hell. And then he reaches out his hand, hold my hand, son. Oh, and then he dies. He died. Just like the snake <sighs> did that we yeah. had. Died right in front of me. I was like, oh, look, oh, look, the snake. Frank is per- perking up and he sticks his little head out. and he- Just to hold your mummy. I've never seen something die in real time except my dad and that snake. And they're both named Frank. Oh, my God. I didn't even think of that. (laughs) Crazy. So uh, (laughs) you doomed that snake from the beginning. (laughs) Yeah, we should have we should have uh, second guessed that decision. I also shouldn't have given him cigarettes. (laughs) Snake. He loved them. (laughs) So the whole time they've been mentioning Kalima. It's like our holy land or whatever. It's it's like the Forbidden Zone from the first movie, Kalima. And you know, you're like, I'm sure Kalima is going to be revealed to be something. Oh, it's actually California, Louisiana, Mexico or something. <laughs> but um, Lacey, what, uh, uh, what happens next in the movie? Okay, well, they reach a camp. They read, they, they, uh, fuck, I don't know why he knows he needs to go that way. Oh, because his little gagger counter is pointing. Yeah. All right, so um, Captain Astronaut, is following his Tamagotchi and it's, it's, it's taking them into the path of, of, of a giant camp of, of apes who are military apes. I'm not completely sure why it is that they're on the border of the water. Is it to protect them from getting into Kalima or is it that they always camp there? They love being by the water. They're scared of. Uh. Oh, I thought you were about to clap. Like, what did I do? All right. Yeah. The two apes with them are three. Are deathly scared three deathly scared of water but there's no time we got to go straight through and look you guys horses oh my god and so they all get a horse and they plow through the camp and the slave trading monkey is miss sorry ape is mistreated and bloodied by his brethren and now, now he's fully on the side of the humans that he's been traveling with also there's a moment of weakness from Ari who returns to the ape camp, I think because she's feeling jilted by No, that's later. But she got the thingy on her hand. Well she goes back That's later? That's later. Oh. And I don't and I think she's going to oh. as a um she's not feeling jilted. She's trying to trick oh. General Fade. Anyway, this is just Whatever. obstacle. They overcome the obstacle. They, they make it through the, the they make it through the ape military camp and they arrive at Kalima, which is just the um, Oberon. The Mark other... Wahlberg's like, This is my ship. Kalima. It's been here a thousand years. What's going on? I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't expect that. Oh, see, yes, this is this is the shit I like. Yeah, this is now. Now I'm like, let's get into it. What are we going to do with this ship? If we're going to make it fart one time. Any, uh, we we find out Kalima is just 
caution live animals. Oh, with, I didn't even notice that. With a tiny little bit of dust over very strategically covered letters mm-hmm. that they then blow off. And they're like, yeah. this isn't Kalima at all. Uh, <laughs> How'd that dust get like that, huh? You would have to blow it like in different pathways to get it like that. Right. That doesn't fall in different What brush on do it? On a sign like that? It's weird. You also realize that Kalima sounds just like the the curse in Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom. Kalima, is that what you said? Do- oh. Kali- oh. Yeah, Kalima, yeah. Kalima. You're right, it does. <laughs> you know, live, live, animals, live animals in that uh, in that in those caves also, we never know. Are they were eating monkey brains. It's a callback. Lacey remembered a movie. How about that? I, I know movies. I know monkey brains. Um, <laughs> Wait, my 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 headcanon is that like an ancient Thade ancestor actually is the one who covered up the, the letters. They could have picked any arrangement of letters. Mm. I, well, who cares? We're who, stuck on something know, strange here. Who cares? I mean, they didn't have to name anything, name it that at all. They could just name it whatever they wanted to. thing that makes me feel like so like, oh, he, he came home is when his Tamagotchi clicks into the little holder. I mean, his hand opens the thing. That's cool. But like in case people miss that, he then goes and clicks his little thing in his ship. And just in that moment, they all believe I'm like, yeah, I come from this ship. And what I was and then it lights <laughs> up and lights come on or whatever. And and then yeah, then he sees warning messages, and it's a call back to the beginning when the guy in, in the in the Oberon, Oberon was like, "We're getting quite the mayday. It's it's all scrambled. We don't know what it is." So it's actually a call back. They were getting a mayday message whenever Mark Wahlberg snuck into his little pod and entered the the metallic storm, whatever. Um, it's actually them from the future. They had landed on that planet looking for Mark Wahlberg and the apes rapidly started becoming smart and in tune or something and they took over and it's them it's them very conveniently explaining what happened to them before they die. In fact, the lady is f- telling us the last little tidbit and then dies on camera. So Yeah, it is <laughs> it is helpful. They're like once we crash landed on this planet, our apes suddenly became very helpful. In fact, there's one ape named Simos who's very intelligent and very help. Oh no, Simos, no! Uh, I think <laughs> you're attacking me. Don't kill me. Right, you're not this. Don't love Mama. Don't love Mama like this. Mama don't like that. <laughs> they say at the beginning of the movie that Pericles it's is about to be a father. But it's still a is cool, the implication that it's a cool little twist. To I think be it's clear, cool. I love this. This is the yeah. this is the reason I like the movie. I love this shit. I like it. But uh-huh. I was saying right. I, I got so heartwarmed when he when he popped his little gadget into the hole and it lit up that I, that if that were me, if I were him, I would sit there for hours and I'd just keep connecting <laughs> it, keep connecting it, keep it'd be the only thing that felt like home. It's very satisfying. It's very yeah. satisfying. Um yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> Is the implication because they say at the beginning of the movie that Pericles is about to be a father? Is Pericles' new son? Is he supposed to be Simos? Maybe, maybe he evolved because because if that planet made the made the primates on the ship more helpful, there's something in the nutrients, something in the water, something that's like enriching their brains and helping them rapidly grow mm-hmm. and become more intelligent. So maybe a a primate born on that island can just rapidly evolve they i don't say, know Wahlberg says that pericles is like genetically altered to be smarter oh so uh, mm. and I, I looked up the name i mean pericles was an ancient greek statesman so i looked up simos was simos his son nope simos no not a reference to anything it's a delicious cola um yeah now all the humans because this this planet has lots of humans remember they're populating much faster than we apes in our affluence and lethargy can they're going to overrun us quickly well now here are all the humans gathered and uh they're looking for a leader they're looking for you captain mark Wahlberg. and he's like i have no interest in leading anybody to do anything i only care about myself (laughs) so there you go that is very honest of you. Uh, this is the point at which Ari goes to see yeah. General Thade and offers herself as a sexual partner. And he takes a brand that is very conveniently in his tent and brands her. And he's like, you want to be like the humans that live like them. And uh, now she has a brand. And this is why Wahlberg decides he will be a, his- a hero after all. He's going to be the inspirational hero to all these humans in their war for the planet of the apes which his big plan is this ship has enough nuclear power in it to blow its engine 
yeah. at a group of of first first battalion. That's right. The, the front line, the least important of the apes. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna catch them on fire. That'll well, do it's it. A, it's a military, you know, tactic. To, I mean, that's that's a big weapon. Like basically saying, like every time you come closer to me, whoever right. you, all the ape, you know, generals are right. going to blow you up. So they don't know this at one time, or I mean, that's we don't know true. how many times they can really do that. So right, it's just a, it to scare the hell out of the apes. You but... saw this giant fireball. That's true. And then you know the battle, the battle sequence. I, I, I think it's pretty well done. I know Lacey didn't like it. What what do you think? about it joshua just just as a pure action sequence the big war yeah i think it's fine i don't think it's anything technical like that exciting or anything um it's got some more of the jumping i don't like the jumping apes in this movie i don't think they jump way too high like on trampolines i don't like that kind of stuff so do some of that here i think um but i don't have a problem with the fight in general but while i do have a problem with again some of the problems with the script like how everybody all the human tribes all the humans from all the different tribes all over the world come together at one moment they say like, oh, we've heard about your legend and stuff like that. Well, how did they hear about it? No one's right. talked about it. The, the, the people that know about him, it's only been like one day or two days. And they only, they're all in one area. They're all still with them. No one went right. to go talk to the human tribes and they have no way of communicating. So like, how did that, you know, plot, there's a lot of plot contrivances in this movie. And as I saw it again, just a couple of days ago, then that's when I really saw the, the problems of the script again, more than I did when I was a teenager. The power and yeah. magnetism of Captain Leo Davidson, as played by Mark Wahlberg, is so so rev- uh, so, so resonant that. that yeah, it just crosses land masses, and people hear about it in distant <laughs> lands and say, "I need to go seek out this man and hear him." It just wafts through the forest. The most limp dick moment of his career when he tries to rabble rouse the fucking. Let, I mean, I'm here, and you guys. An uh, explosion. So let's get him. I, I, I think that I, yeah, and I think I will blame Tim Burton on this. I think that he his characters, his heroes are almost always misfits and oddballs. Right. That is not what this man is. This is, man is attractive. Like, does he have a movie other than this? Like, the, where he has like somebody is just trying to be a sincere, inspirational hero <laughs> who you can follow. Like. Um, I just watched, I watched Sleepy Hollow last night and Johnny Depp plays Ichabod Crane and he said, I'm playing him like a scared 13 year old and he's supposed to be the, the, the hero mm-hmm. of the movie. Like that's what Tim Burton likes to do. He likes to like undermine his heroes. So I just think, I think it's just. It, Tim Burton I, can't envision. I mean, besides Bat, besides Batman, I don't really see a lot of his like heroic big, uh, legendary characters like doing that. But his his Batman that was a is misfit too, though. That's yeah. that's why that's why his Batman is his Batman movies are so good is because Batman, Bruce Wayne are such weird people. Yeah, he's an introvert. Shut in. Yeah. He hangs upside down from yeah. a crowbar after <laughs> after having sex with Vicky Vale. Um, anyway, they they basically <laughs> the war is is raging, but then the ape from the sky appears in his spaceship Pericles. He lands. Uh, and it's, I, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, the whole battle stops cause they're all like, Oh my God, Seamos is real. He's come, he's returned just like they always said he would. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just Pericles, the, the chimp who was able to land the pod, which, which Mark Wahlberg was unable to do successfully land the pod. And I like that they kept saying at the beginning of the movie, he's trained to return, return to, the to Oberon. Oberon. That's his training. That's and that's right. what he's trying to do. He knows the, the ship is here. I got to return to it that okay i didn't think of that that makes sense um but i i just love that the person most fit the two people i guess most fit to actually lead this planet going forward the two apes are ari ari and then her partner that dies which that's Uh sad to me um but a a child I mean, that's all you can think about when you see Pericles, right? I mean, he, he, he's a sub in for a child. You'd have to take care of him that way. That, that Mark's big idea is like, well, here's a baby. You're a woman. You, you like baby, right? Here's a baby. Okay. Bye. Yeah. I'm going to earth now. Well, his, <laughs> it's like, don't bog down this woman with a child. His, his, his ideas are not the most. God. Uh, that's the president of this city or earthy or, Planity, whatever the fuck. Yeah, he he his ideas are not that uh, enlightened about gender roles. It's true. Fine. Uh, so Pericles <laughs> runs into the Oberon. He gets chased by Thade 
and Leo Davidson and Leo starts shooting at Thade with the gun, but then Thade gets the gun and there's just some back and forth and it ends with him with Thade, Tim Roth getting locked in a thing. I love that. I love but that. What, so wait, wait, how would we describe the thing he gets locked in? He just closes the door on him. Well, it's just the area. It's the, it's the main. Right. It's just a room. It's just a room that Mark knows he can open with Cock his hand and close it with his hand. Yeah, it's mission control or maybe uh, even. Uh, it could be, could be something very important, ship? but whatever it is, it uh, has a door and that's what's important. Yeah. It yeah, is, it yeah. Is, it is satisfying that he he mm-hmm. conquers the villain by closing a door on him by pressing his hand on a thing. I'm like that's that. And um, I it's I like that they you know shoots, <laughs> you know, putting his hand on something that's been there for thousands of years and still works. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's nuclear power on the ship. It'll last for a thousand you know, years. A little more convenience. <laughs> uh, but I, I like when Thade starts shooting the gun. It starts ricocheting on him, and then he just cowers under the desk and he's scared and he's just a poor little chimp at that point it makes me sad when he does that it's also sad that pericles gets wounded and yeah. he crawls back into his cage and he just wants he just wants to go lay down god that ugh. he just looks too much like our kid yeah our that's kid, all i could our think kid about looks like a chimpanzee <laughs> he does no well the way that he he's just a sweetheart he's just doing what he's told he doesn't feel good. He's going to lay down in his room. Yeah, that's true. I think it's sweet and sad. Uh, but they don't kill Thade. They just leave him there. I, and mm. again, I like that. This is setting up the end of the movie. Um, Ari begs Wahlberg to stay. Please stay. He's like, absolutely not. I'm getting the fuck out of here. But they still kiss. Ugh. He happily leaves in his pod. He leaves Pericles behind. There is a funny moment where Limbo... Paul Wait, you're skipping. Like, oh, I want to thank oh, you. You're, you're skipping. You're, you're skipping one before he kisses her. He kisses Ari, the chimp, out of nowhere, like just to say goodbye, and it's a weird romantic kiss too. And then he kisses her, with, and they're both weird, like forced, creepy <laughs> kisses because like yes. they didn't earn these love interests in any way. No, no, it's just like it's he just really like, had to just do that that kiss. I don't know if it's trying to be like pr- provocative or something, but it just didn't doesn't make sense it doesn't work. work i mean she liked him i already liked him but he, he didn't necessarily like her but then like he's kind of like having like a pity kiss i guess to leave yeah to do on the lips i don't know i just I don't know. <laughs> it is it me. is a pity kiss and then to do it to kiss. her to stella warren because she's a like human they were never romantic the whole time like all right. of a sudden this it just seems weird i think she kissed him because maybe she was jealous of the ari kiss or something but i don't know the whole thing was weird there is a scene earlier where uh, where uh Estella Warren is watching Mark Wahlberg and Helena Bonham Carter sitting close to each other by the fire. Yeah. And she looks really pissed and storms and away. She walks away. Yeah. She's definitely yeah. wants to mate with him. Yeah. But, um, but I thought it would just be funny if he like, he just kind of rounded out the set and then he went, he just <laughs> went and like kissed, you know, on, on a, like the slave trader. And then he kissed the little boy and yeah. then he, just, he just kept kissing. That would have been funny. This is what we do back on earth when and, we leave. Uh, right and i'm gonna miss you and i'm gonna miss you and then he kisses the monkey on the lips his, his uh his pericles he's he's kissing both of these women because he knows like this is the quickest way out of this right yes he's like okay well awkward dad we both <laughs> wanted yeah <laughs> yeah yeah he's a true. again he wants to just get the fuck off this he planet and never think about it is again a sailor leaving for shore leave he knows he's going to something better that is not this I like Paul Giamatti. He's like, you've opened my eyes to a whole new world of trade with the humans. Now, kids, who wants aspirin? <laughs> I like that he, he hasn't learned anything. Uh, yeah. So now the end of the movie. Lacey, explain what happens at the end of this movie. All right. So he gets it. it, it he, you know what happens to Captain Theo Greyjoy, whatever the fuck his name is. Mm-hmm. He gets exactly what he deserves. He hops in the pod, leaving everyone behind after completely changing their world. They don't know what the hell to do with themselves. Plus giving a baby to a perfectly fine woman who was going to be a leader. And he goes into the same time warp um, electric storm and thinks he's going to go, I'm going to go to earth. Yeah. With all my bros. Cause you know, I don't want to miss the wedding of my friends. Uh, that lady got engaged in that video that they <laughs> <Yeah>. see me. <laughs> <laughs> and and, he, and then and then what do you know? It says it says Earth on his little computer, and I was like, Matt, what if it says Earth? You know, he just saw it wrong. Earth. Anyway, okay. So he goes to that planet, and and he lands, and and it's a human talking to him, and per, you do not have permission to land. It all sounds very America. It sounds very air traffic controllica, 
and and you realize, oh, silly, you're landing in the the freaking memorial long swimming pool thing that's right in front of the mall. Um, right in front of the mall that no, no, that's what it's called I'm the kidding. mall i know okay. you're landing right in, in, in into the uh lincoln monument and he's like well i'm gonna have a big bill on here but at least i'm back to earth and he goes up the steps and abe is a um, ape yeah he's ape lincoln mm-hmm. what a twist yeah i nailed it he's back on earth but now it's filled with apes what the hell Audiences hated this ending. I like it. When I saw it as a kid, I was so confused, <laughs> but I still liked it. Uh, but they had yeah. to include an insert to the DVD to explain to explain <laughs> how this works. Do you have it with you there, Josh? Did you just Joshua? Did you just pick up an insert? I actually, I actually own this one on uh, two disc collector's edition on DVD because I, I did like it, and I watched all the extras and stuff again for this uh, comment or this. Um, not commentary, but discussion podcast. Um, yeah, there's one little part that says like, oh, what if somebody came before uh, Leo got back? And apparently that's what they did. So they'd gotten in his spaceship at some point. And the way that this, you know, the answers for this, why this people are like, oh, why does this, how did this happen? It doesn't make any sense. It makes sense with time travel, you know, right. shenanigans. You know, you saw how, how the Pericles got in. He left before. Uh, Leo did and got in the thing, and he, he arrived way later than him. Well, same thing that happened to Thade. He, he left later than Leo did, but he got there way earlier than he did. That's because you know time right. travel was not is not it's cyclical. It's not it's not linear. So that's how it happened. And he was able yeah, to yeah. influence. I don't know. Maybe he brought a bunch. I didn't. Somebody got the. They got the whole spaceship dock working. They got it, brought a whole bunch of armies in there, and they <laughs> took over. And they eventually, over thousands of years, I guess they took over the human race again. And that's how they. It's weird that it's Lincoln, but it just should be like some kind of politician. Right. It doesn't have to be Lincoln's figure or like 1600s. It has to be, you know, uh, someone they, they they made a statue of because he led the people to freedom or whatever, or human apes to freedom. I think that the movie, That's why I say. the movie technically does show you that like the electromagnetic storm like reflects time, so things that happen later on one end will happen earlier on the other end, but it doesn't make it very clear. Yeah. And like I definitely didn't realize that when I watched it for the first time, and then I turned on Tim Burton's commentary, and he's not helpful at all. <laughs> he's like, I just thought this ending would be like cool or something. I thought it was cool. I, um, you can't escape your problems. You're, you're going to have to deal with people being different from other things, and you're going to have to find a way to live on the planet you're on in harmony with these things. And that's what I thought the message was: is like you want to get in this pod, and you got on that spaceship and, and made that decision to do the work you were doing because you were probably trying to run from something or make something better or, or you thought there was something better out there. And then you leave this planet because you're running and you think there's something better out there and you just keep finding yourself in the same place. And I think that's the message, right? Just stay where you are. Don't do anything. No, just find a way to get <laughs> along. We're all just going to keep finding each other. Yeah, okay. I there win! I win the podcast. <laughs> I love, but I, 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 act, I love this ending and I love this idea of time travel of like, there's nothing you can do to stop people in the future from fucking with you right now, which is kind of what Tenet is about. But uh, they left Fade alive and he had the rest of his life to figure out how to use a spaceship and oh, now he can totally change the past. I get what you're saying now. <laughs> I don't understand what you meant about Fade going anywhere any at any point way i got you got you got you you. so i really like the ending i really like the ending too yeah okay i do too i think it's i think it's it's something different it stands out it's a good twist and it makes sense if you think about it and the first time i did watch it i was confused by that too but then watching this the second time or the third time was the third time at least i watched it i was like yeah because it shows you how the pericles comes later and it shows how and, Mm -hmm. and and the original spaceship also came later after them arrived thousands of years before they did you know so it's not clear how when you, where you're going to come back and it makes sense and i wish and then i'm really mad that they didn't follow up on a sequel to this because of it didn't do well in the box office a bomb people don't like it whatever but um that's why they left it open like that to do it to explain it more in the sequel they were planning on doing that it it, it actually did do really it it was a big hit they just the studio uh it was the rare instance of the studio knowing that nobody liked it and there wasn't an appetite for a sequel it was remarkable restraint because oh, okay. usually right. uh, it was a hit, okay. but the, but Tim Burton wasn't interested in in doing another one, right. and it, and yeah. without 
I, and enjoy. I guess maybe maybe everybody just had a bad experience. They, they weren't going to get any of the same people back on the project. The reviews were bad. The only person oh. who liked it was 13-year-old Matt Stokes. So Okay, well, you said it was a hit. So like, who the fuck's like... So you're saying the Rotten Tomatoes is like really askew? I don't think it was a huge hit. See, I think it was, a, it was a hit, but I don't think people actually... People went to see it and then left the theater saying that was bad. Oh, okay. So it... But they it, already had their money. It just had a big It made drop. only $180 million in America on a hundred million dollar budget and 362 million worldwide. So it's a, it's a, that's, yeah, that's big for 2000. It's no, it's, for 2001, enough that's for a big. sequel. That's, that's yeah. really big for, I mean, yeah. much, much less successful movies have gotten sequels. That's a, that's a for, for 2001. That's, that's pretty big. Let's see where it ranks in 2001. I want to look to see if there's like any uh, remnants of what would happen in that sequel, what kind of an outline or something. Cause I think, I think it's a great idea. I mean, to this is this time it is Earth, and apes well, where, have taken where, where over. Where would you go? Where would you go though? Well, I, I wish they would con- just. I, you know, I was, I'm a little annoyed. I, I mean, I really want to see Kingdom of the Planet Apes. I'm excited for it, but I also had that high on my list before I even saw the trailer. I'm a little annoyed by the premise. Again, humans still being there and still being like, oh, let's be nice to humans and have equality. I don't want that storyline anymore. I want more of the storylines from the sequels like Dawn and War, where it's more about the apes and more about their culture and more about what they're doing. And forget the humans. Let them kill them off. Keep them in a different area or whatever. Don't. I don't want to keep discussing them, but they keep doing it. So... That's what I would do. I would get rid of the humans. Yeah, I think I think back. I think they'd they'd probably make it about a human resistance or something. Like like them really getting together. Yeah, yeah. Because taking it back. I don't think they were like. I think now the the new apes movies are very much about the apes, and there are very mm-hmm. few human characters, uh, and the apes are way more interesting than the humans. Um, but they're probably. You know, back then they thought, no, nobody's going to want to see a movie that doesn't have any people in it. Yeah. Yeah. Avatar wasn't a thing yet. Hey, folks, just want to let you know that next week's episode, which is episode 115. Wow. 115 uh, coming out May 17th, 2024 is going to be on Lacey's selection, Sister Act, the Whoopi Goldberg film, Sister Act, directed by Emilio Ardolino, who directed Dirty Dancing. See that past episode or episodes, Sister Act next week. Okay, let's go around the room and give our final thoughts and our star ratings for Planet of the Apes 2001, starting with our guest. Yeah, so I uh, give this three and a half stars, rated enjoyable. Like I said, I think it's good enough. I think it's got some really good things in it, but it's got all these problems with the script and the characters. They don't care. You don't care about the characters. You don't. I mean, I like Mark Wahlberg, and he wasn't great in this, but I think he's good. But Estella Warren, the other boy, Chris Christopherson, <laughs> yeah. they don't give any kind of characterization to them. You don't learn much yeah. about Thade or general at or whatever at uh lieutenant at uh you know, michael Clark done scared you don't you only hear much about them there's not much backstory there's not much development in their arcs or anything like that so that's really the problem but like the production design the costumes the makeup like rick baker are all amazing so i mean like yeah. i said it's it's good but not great i think that's fair lacy i gave it two and a half um i felt like it had dips in energy or it might just be me dipping but mainly I just felt like I did not know exactly what tone it was going for I was very distracted by Tim Roth the whole time um, it felt it felt like there were fun moments but because of the cruelty of the monkeys toward the humans it just kind of it harshed my vibe man uh, I don't want to watch it again and uh, so two and a half I, I, I acknowledge amazing costume, amazing mm-hmm. makeup. There were very good performances in there. They just weren't all good performances. Surprised you gave it even that much because you uh, seemed really. Or did I un- give it a two? Let me go to Letterboxd. You seemed really unhappy in the moment. I was unhappy in the moment. With the movie, not with the world. Uh, but at, toward the end, once it gets, once you get the spaceship, I was like, okay, this is kind of interesting. Um, I gave it two and a half. Yeah, two and a half. Hmm. Okay, I'm I, I'm I'm torn between two and a half and three. My threshold for recommend is three. I don't think I'd recommend it, but I still have a lot of affection for this movie, and I would sooner watch this again than I'd watch any of the new movies. I think you have to give it a three because of what it means to you. Even though I acknowledge those are better movies, more uh, accomplished movies, and they have something to say. I mean, every Planet of the Apes movie is yeah. inherently political, except this one. 
which is oh. a big problem. Right. What was it saying? It just sexy boy gets trapped on mean island and wants to get away. What it's saying is don't fly through that storm. Right. Yeah. Stop like- going through the. Yeah. When you're in a spaceship <laughs> and you're on your way home, maybe don't find the most dangerous thing and go into it. And it's like if I ever encounter that situation in life, I'll remember my training from Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. But other than that, I got nothing. I think Mark Wahlberg is disastrously bad, and he. Oh wow! For the most part, I I, I like Wahlberg. Um, like I, did, did you did you see the Uncharted movie, Joshua? Yeah, I, I see uh, almost all his movies. Yeah, Uncharted. Yeah, he's fine in that. But did you like that movie? I'd probably give it like three and a half, the same kind of thing. Like it's it's enjoyable, but it's not good, like great. And I'm not. I wasn't a big fan of the game. I haven't played a whole lot of the games, so I don't know like all the problems with it, like a lot of the gamers do. It doesn't have a lot of the game stuff in it. Well, with him in that movie, and he's the second lead of the movie. Tom Holland's the lead. But even, as I'm watching those two together, yeah. I think like Mark Wahlberg needs to be the lead of this movie. He has an innate movie star quality. Yeah, he does. Even when he's not totally engaged. Right. Uh, he, he, he just sort of has that screen presence. But it seems like it's just not in Planet of the Apes at all. Right. It's way, uh, it, I think it truly is that Tim Burton didn't know what to do. I don't. I don't see a big problem with it. I don't think he's got enough of a character to really, you know, latch exactly. on to like he does. Right, right. Like, you right. know, Mark Wahlberg is a good actor, but not a, a, he doesn't have that. He doesn't flex his range very much. Like one of the exactly. things I do on my letter, on my letterbox is actually um, rank um, performances by actors. And when I did for his, I was like, well, a lot of these are kind of the same. So like, how do I rank these? There's only a few that he really stretched, like Boogie Nights and Father Stew, and um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Uh, he's, he's The Departed. The Departed, he's great in, but he does the same kind of tough guy stuff, you know, like, he's played the same kind of character in so many movies, like Four Brothers and the Transformers movies, and, and, um, I mean, uh, Contraband and tons of stuff, Perfect Storm, he's good, yeah, he's a little different Perfect Storm, he's got a beard, (laughs) Uh, I guess that's a good range there, rated beard, Um, but yeah, I I always like, I like him, but I can see how people don't like, oh, Fear is one of his better roles, too, he's a little bit different, he's psychotic, you know, like, those kind of things, I wish he'd do more of those, I do too, I loved him in fear. I just, and, and but I really feel like the problem is is Burton, just more interested in the production design and the uh, costumes and the uh, van in telling a very captivating story. Yeah, Tim, but, Bur- Tim Burton relies on huge gravitas actors who can make a mountain out of, can, can do a lot with a little and, and they're weird. They lean into the weird where it just, he isn't weird. He's too vanilla to be weird. You can't. That's the other. It's just. just it's just a bad too, match. It is a bad match. I like that they liked each other, though. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. I, love that. I like that they like each other. Okay. Um, All right. This is not like enough complexity. I think. Um, I also. I also want to mention real quick that. Um, hold on. So I also want to mention that Terra Notary also uh, it was one of the first times he did like the movement. Um, coach that went to ape school you know for all the actors like all that stuff is great you know the different ways of getting on the horses and climbing on things and totally terry Henry also worked oh. on the new you know rise and dawn and and war as a movement coach and also played rocket uh when the main characters as you know an ape um so he's that was one of his first times he really got into the monkey uh, ape aspect and he's done a lot for whole career of it now is doing like a movement and like um behaviorist kind of thing for the actors so i think that was really cool like they did tried so hard to make this work it just they need a better script really it came down to it yeah what 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 is the um what title does that does he have mimic coach like in the credits what what is he credited <sighs> movement as? coach mo- movement coach i believe or like um behavior kind of specialist you know a behavior specialist that kind of thing or usually like a stunt performer does a lot of that too the stunts like for um fade fade's uh, uh tim roth's character in the movie mm-hmm. yeah and uh he so he's 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 one of the leaders of that kind of like um you know like 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 with andy circus doing the performance capture and also with the being a simian i guess as well yeah that 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 would have really taken me out of it if those things weren't there but sometimes it took me out of it how present they were there because i wouldn't say that that's a big uh thing that they focused on in the original but their costumes were enough for me so i don't know i don't know i can't tell if it hurt it's good but i don't know if in this case it hurt it or helped it i really don't know it's one of those things that's like okay well apes really do jump yeah so we want to have that but do they jump that high (laughs) right and and it that just seems like that was it's so comical it is silly it is silly and then every time they hit a human they go real high it's like okay okay guys you have wire workers we got it 
fucking I see the strings. Yeah. They went too hard on that. Lacks a cohesive vision for how all of this fits together. Yeah. I know it's because they were rushed. Tim Burton mm-hmm. says he usually has at least a year to edit his movies. This time he had three months. Oh wow. Um so just hey, don't make movies like that, but that's what they do. And yeah. it's even worse. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, they're definitely rushed on that. Tell everybody about your TikTok channel. Or or uh, anything you want to tell. Anything else you want to tell our audience about. Well, again, I'm Cinematic Joshua. Please uh, give me a like and follow. I, I'm very active on there. I, like I said, do a lot of reviews and do different ways of, of you know, like elevator reviews if I can. I do a lot of fun lists. I have um, a lot of different, you know, different kind of rating systems from awesome, uh, awesome to awful and all the, everything in between. Um, I have, have actually have a uh, not just a five star rating system, but a six star rating system. If I really loved it, I could go even five and a half or six stars. So I think it's pretty unique. But um, yeah, a lot of fun stuff going on there. I comment <laughs> a lot of times uh, on different people's uh, videos and I comment back on my videos and stuff and follow low bearing beams on TikTok also, I think they're great. Uh, I Thank love what you. I love. I love when they especially do the uh, Animation. anim- animated, uh, you know, interstitials, yeah, and different like um, highlights of the video. I also plan on not only doing for this video uh, for the podcast, but also my butterfly effect one. You know, cutting, making some uh, highlight cuts and putting that on there too. It's I haven't got around to doing that yet, but uh, I'm going to. I will. Um, so that. yeah, a lot of fun there and on uh, TikTok and again. I'm also going to be doing more on YouTube in case TikTok gets, does get banned or whatever. I'm going to be on a <laughs> really, right. really awesome show on, on YouTube and uh, doing the same kind of stuff there. Awesome. Okay. We rate you awesome. We do. Joshua. We, we give you six stars. <laughs> Thank you. Thank As you. for us, uh, please give us please give us five stars on iTunes. And We're not greedy. Just five. And Spotify, if you must. We're on YouTube at Load Bearing Beams Pod, where we post all of our episodes in full video but if you're listening on audio that's okay too in fact in fact thank you i really want to start a patreon just wanted to drop that nugget here oh, just uh, okay no problem what <laughs> we want money <laughs> all right yeah uh okay you instantly yes, get so anxious when i say i'm just putting that out there all right all right well yeah but here's what happens when no. i say it's time to watch a movie you're like fuck well, so this, so now to be, let's do two a week. The Patreon could be that they get to be on a Discord server with me, and they and they get we get to talk movies. Who's I going to pay for that. They would pay to support. You could do it right now. <laughs> Why would? Yes, I'm saying Patreon doesn't have to be extra episodes. It's a lot you of do things. Like a, uh, commentary on the movie. That's what people it's a pay news, for. Like, you, know, you don't fucking know people. I know people. Do your own commentary, like as the movie. I mean, this is kind of like commentary, but do a commentary as the movie goes the whole time and like comment on it as it goes. Yeah, we did yeah. talk about what, yeah. What what we will yeah. probably do, and I guess this is the first time we've said it on the podcast, is before we launch anything like a Patreon, we might produce like a single commentary and just sell it a la carte. Sell it. Yeah, that feels weird. I want them to b- be mm-hmm. buying into our brand on a monthly basis for whatever we put out. Not like here's a product, buy it. We'll talk off air. That's what Patreon we'll t- is. That's not the same. They're part of a club if they're in Patreon. Oh I want God. them to join our club. I hear you saying you have to have something a little different. Yeah. Yeah. I think Lacey thinks we're more popular than we are. I'm on Letterboxd <laughs> at Matt Stokes Nine. Lacey's on Letterboxd at Load Bearing Lacey, which sounds pornographic, but I swear it's not. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Stokes Nine. The show is on Twitter at Load Bearing Pod. The show is on Instagram at Load Bearing Beams. The show is on TikTok at Load Bearing Beams. My band is called Roll Out 9. We do the music for Load Bearing Beams. We have an album called The Joy of Averages. You can hear it on Spotify, Apple Music, and everything everywhere else you get your music. Otherwise, that's all we have to say. Lacey and I are going to have a little talk. Okay, I love you. Bye. All right. <laughs> Don't fucking Thank end you so with much. your Bye-bye. voice. I end. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Three, four. Load bearing beams.